So have you ever wanted something so badly and had to work so hard at it that it exhausted all hope, all faith, all energy? What was that one thing for you? Our story isn't common, but our story isn't uncommon. We are ordinary people with a story of love, of call, and at times, hopelessness. And it is our honor to be here to share it with you today. We started out like most couples do, young and in love. When we started out, there was a little bit of a physical distance between us, and it was far before cell phones, so we were talking on our landlines for hours and hours, um, talking about beginning relationship stuff, establishing our roots, if you will. And I'll always remember one of our first conversations about family and size, and Dave, growing up as an only child, indicated that he for sure wanted more than one child. And, well, that wish came true. <laughs> <laughs> and I also remember Kim talking about how she grew up in a family with four okay. children, and I thought that that was the perfect size. It felt fun, it felt exciting. And also along this time, I remember us talking a lot about our interest and perhaps openness to adoption down the road. But we also knew that we wanted to at least try to have biological children. In the moments of that talk, building a family sounded really easy. It felt, we felt so good about the roots that we had and were so excited about the possibility of our love extending. But here's what most people don't talk about. Sometimes making a family isn't all that easy. I mean, sure, it starts out kind of fun, <laughs> but sometimes that doesn't last that long. Um, for us, it was months and months, well, years of struggling. Hopelessness, anger, fear, um, loss of faith. And after about four years, endless doctor appointments, lots of prayer and money, and a bag full of needles, we found out on February 12th, 2007, that we were finally pregnant. And just two weeks after that, twins. On September 22nd, 2007, Jensen and Kylie were born. And I knew the moment that I delivered our sweet little girls that I couldn't wait to do it again, even all of it. And funny thing, one October evening in 2009, we had the best news, the best news again. We were pregnant, and Caleb was a very wonderful, planned surprise. <laughs> yeah. And although his creation story was much different than our daughter's, the pregnancy was filled with a lot of worry and fear, and we were back to those feelings again. But then, on June 17, 2010, we welcomed our healthy baby boy, Caleb, into the world. And I knew the day that I delivered Caleb that I was never doing pregnancy again. <laughs> but in the quiet of my heart, I was pretty sure that I wasn't done having children. It was about the time that Caleb, I think, was close to four months old, that my heart started to feel this nudge towards adoption. And so for me, that's when all the reading and researching began. And I remember lightly bringing up the topic to Dave. And we were not at all on the same page. <laughs> and so we went our separate ways. And honestly, who thinks about adding to their family when they have three little children under the age of four anyway? Our life was busy and loud and chaotic. But when I stopped long enough to listen, I still felt this nudge. And not so much for me. <laughs> I, at the time, really felt like our family was the perfect size. Mm -hmm. It was manageable. And we had been through so much to have these beauties that I couldn't understand why we would choose to get out of our rhythm. We had finally found one, first of all. And I kind of started to think that our family was complete. <laughs> but then the phone call. Kim was away at work, and she called me in tears. She was reading a book about adoption, and she didn't want me to give her an answer. She just wanted me to promise that I would pray, and not pray that she would get her way or that I would get my way, but that instead we would both choose to be faithful in this decision. So we prayed, sort of. 
<laughs> so I gave him a lot of space, and we didn't talk about it for a really long time after that. Which basically means that when she came home from the trip, we talked about it. <laughs> Two days. For the next few months after that, our conversations kept growing, and it became really apparent. We honestly were both really called to adopt, but like many people wondering and feeling called to adopt, we honestly had no idea what to do. We couldn't fathom how to go about it. How, when, where, and how much does it really cost? That was what was holding me up the most, was the cost. I couldn't understand how and why we would even make this work. I mean, we, we both work in the church, <laughs> and so it didn't seem very feasible to us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we both knew that we felt called to adopt, and to adopt internationally. Mm -hmm. A statistic that kept holding on to us is that there are approximately 153 million orphans in the world today. And furthermore, since we do both work in the church, another statistic that really seemed to hold on to us was one that our social worker had shared with us. She told us that if 7% of people who identified themselves as Christians were to adopt adoptable children, there would be no orphan crisis in the world. Yeah. None. And that would leave 7% of them to tend to 90. advocacy, excuse me, 93% 93. Yeah. of them to tend to advocacy, to fostering, to other childhood needs. And this is just data that reflects Christians. And there are a lot of loving, caring people in the world. And we firmly believe in all humanity joining together. Just imagine the possibilities. And so we finally did. We opened our hearts and our wings and about the time that Caleb turned one, we jumped onto the road of adopting, knowing that it can take a long time, especially international adoption. So after much prayer and research, we found ourselves on the road pursuing the adoption of a little one, aged zero to two, from Uganda. It seems like we were back on the endless waiting game. We were on this waiting road for almost two years, and near the end of that time, I found myself with the opportunity to travel with a team to Ethiopia. And almost immediately after my return, our adoption agency called. And they said, we're pretty sure that we're going to close our Uganda program. And so we're thinking that this won't likely happen. And so these feelings, which are all too familiar to us, we felt hopeless frustrated, and didn't really know what to do next. Kim's travel to Ethiopia did, however, bring up some new questions for us. She had seen so many older children not yet placed, just waiting in orphanages. And so we began to wonder if perhaps we would be open to older children. And if so, how old? And if so, how will we find a new agency to help us with this? We once again were just filled with uncertainty, but what we did was continue to draw from our faith and from the root of our relationship that had just grown stronger in our then 11 years of marriage. And then in June, I saw their faces. This picture in a newsletter highlighting waiting children. Two beautiful boys. I remember opening the newsletter and right above their picture it said, these boys are looking for a forever family. Could it be yours? And just as excited as my heart was when I saw a positive pregnancy test, it was again when the words came to my mouth, I think it could. The tricky part is, while all of this was going on, I was traveling up the north shore of Lake Superior with a good friend of mine about to disappear into the Boundary Waters for a few days. But thanks to the wonder of text messaging and smartphones, mm -hmm. I too was able to see this picture. And my heart also leapt as I thought to myself, yes, I think that our family could be their forever home. So we decided together that we should learn a little bit more about them, and I, like any good husband, said, okay, 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 you take care of that. <laughs> and then I am going to go camping. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so I did. I disappeared into the wilderness for three days, but in that time, yeah. I found myself at peace, reflective, drawing on my faith, and mm -hmm. constantly being reinforced by the root of our love and our relationship together. So that when I came out, I was scared, yes, but I wasn't scared about saying yes. 
I was actually scared that perhaps Kim had found out information that would make us say no. So there I was, all by myself, with two five-year-olds and one three-year-old, and um, looking at these two beautiful boys. And I would stare at this picture for hours, praying and praying. The next morning, I quickly called our social worker to get as much information as I could. We found out that our two boys were uh, living in the orphanage for just under two years. They were loved deeply by their parents, who were now deceased. She sent me their complete paperwork, and I scoured over every single page, and I invited my good friend, who's a pediatrician, to do the same. Worried about the same things that Dave was, but as I was looking over the pages, I realized that there wasn't a darn thing in that paperwork that would change my yes to a no. So we had to work really hard over the next few weeks to formally say yes. So we had to work rather quickly. Yeah. We had to change our paperwork from Uganda to Ethiopia and from saying that we were going to adopt a little one, ages zero to two, to two older children. <laughs> it was a bit nerve-wracking for us. But for then sure. on November 13th, 2013, Kim, our daughter Kylie, and I stood before a judge and promised to care for Jonas and not Nail the same way that we would care for any child in our family. And on that November morning, we officially became a family of seven when we passed court in Ethiopia. We now had five children. On my 35th birthday, we said goodbye to our sons, and the wait to bring them home began. We were legally their parents in Ethiopia, but now the wait for the U.S. to clear them so they could come home with us began. And just as things were supposed to be wrapping up and getting easy, we got word that our adoption agency was now closing. So there was no one left to advocate for our case. We were scared and nervous all over again and didn't know what to do. After a couple quick weeks of hard work and conversations, we decided that I would go to Ethiopia to try to finish things up and Dave would stay home with our other children because we literally had no idea what to do and how long it would take. And so I boarded an airplane with my dear friend Mel and we traveled to Ethiopia and with the help of our good friends and translators, we traveled the countryside, gathering up paperwork. I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> I was navigating documents in three different languages and endless visits to the US Embassy. And as challenging as all of that was, I'm not sure it was any more challenging than me trying to figure out how in the world to parent our new children. Because while they weren't infants, our relationship was definitely in its infancy. And I was at home trying as hard as I could to be as supportive as I could from across an ocean. But of course, communication across an ocean and between two very different countries isn't quite the same as our nation's cell phone coast-to-coast -coast plans, and so I would just wait in hopeful anticipation for any news that I had to find out how things were going. And then after two weeks of work and worry, on April 3rd, 2014, we cleared the U.S. Embassy. And on April 5th, we landed home in America to a welcome party that I could have only imagined. We've been home together for just shy of two years. And here's what everyone wants to know. How's it going? <laughs> well, there are days when managing a multicultural family with five children is a breeze. It's fun and it's easy. And there are days not so much. Yeah. We have totally altered family structure for all of us, and so we spend a lot of our time tending to the many different needs of our entire family. It's complex, it's challenging, it's messy, yet it's peaceful at times and simple. It, it's full, yeah. if you will. And we are surrounded by amazing friends and family and our churches, and we are accompanied by phenomenal psychologists and doctors and educators. Mm -hmm. And every day, we constantly have to remind ourselves mm -hmm. to nurture the root of our love, that the love that brought us together and to this family needs to be tended and cared for. And here's what we've learned and continue to learn. Roots and Wings has never meant more to us. It's the story to our relationship and the beginning of our call to a family. It's absolutely essential in our responsibility to give all of our children roots. In our family, that includes continuing to nurture each of our child's sweet and strong 
personalities. It means Ethiopian traditions and holidays and food being served right while we're eating lefsa. <laughs> we honor roots, culture, and relationships, and race as we continue to try to graft us all together. To parent is to accept the opportunity and call to give your children wings. And so for us, as we're still tending to the raising and embracing and reinforcing, it's our prayer that because of these roots, our children will one day, will all children everywhere, will soar with wings to pursue living and loving with wonder. Thank you. Thank you.